we'll get on with it with the other two talks this afternoon before we even move on to the round table. So as uh, Rene had introduced himself before, he, he's part of the, the, the global uh, marketing arm looking at vertical industry solutions. Uh, I'm sorry, looking at vertical <coughs> industries in, in general. Uh, Rene brings a wealth of experience and a wealth of knowledge um, to the table. So um, he will continue on with the number of the connected solutions. Thank you, Rene, uh, Mark. Yep. So first of all, uh, I want to uh, thank you. And I'm, I'm very happy that you saved all your questions this morning for this session. You know, we're going to have some interaction on uh, questions. I think eventually my slides will show up, or do I have to do something? Clicker? No, no, no clicker. No, I'm looking at something else, then that's on the screen. switch back to his laptop. Yeah. My laptop is connected. I'm not using the clicker. So, while we wait until the, this technical challenge is uh, being addressed. I have a slide deck here where I'm going to present only about 20 slides, of course we only have 45 uh, minutes of interaction. You will get the slide deck afterwards to go through it uh, at your own leisure, because there is uh, a lot of information in there, which is um, which we will not present, once again, due to the lack of time. It works there, but it work here. Now, what I will not present, <laughs> what I will not present, <laughs> Our slides are the business rationale behind it because we uh, came up with um, why are we doing products and solutions alone or with partners and architecture. We don't do that without, of course, having a business rationale. Uh, we focused on a couple of things. Either it enhances the revenue, so you make more money. You reduces the cost of running your operations, so you improve your margins. Or you avoid cost, for instance, in oil and gas, you are aligned and compliant to law and regulations, and you have a minimum amount of unplanned downtime and spillage and stuff like that. So those are basically the three main drivers we look at, more revenues, less cost, and cost avoidance. And there's also a fourth element we sometimes include in it, and that's could say that's retainment of revenues and that's loyalty of the customers, customer satisfaction. They want to come back to doing business with you. Now, I don't, okay, there we go. We're in business. Um, so once again, this is a slide deck uh, I'll make available to you, which uh, we talk about a little bit about the macroeconomic developments and uh, Sergi also uh, pointed out on a couple of things like the oil price, uh, the current oil price, is it an inhibitor or do we see acceleration of innovation and stuff like that. But we will uh, dive straight to a couple of examples and user cases and what we call CVBOs. That's Customer Validated Business Outcome. And that goes back to, does it enhance your revenues? Does it lower your operational cost? Does it avoid cost? Stuff like that. So I will click on this <laughs> button here and hopefully that will bring us to this section, which uh, details first, I mean, Cisco is a large company, but we cannot do it alone. We need uh, partners to go to market. Schneider Electric, like Amazon, a couple of other partners we have. We have customers and sometimes we do innovative things together with customers, but we are also very active in uh, several standards and protocol bodies. Um, for instance, uh, the Society of Petroleum Engineers, but ESA as well, to have a lot of those standards, like the ESA 99, also known as the IEC, IEC 62443, which is about industrial security. We have people on those boards, helping to shape the standards and of course make sure that we can support or align with the 
those standards. ODTA is, for instance, another nice example, open device uh, that the vendor association, because we at Cisco, of course, like to believe, tend to believe that everything is TCP IP over standard Ethernet. Well, when I started working in the industrial network a few years ago, by now I have identified 21 different protocols running from serial to wires to exotic protocols. So it's not only Ethernet and TCP IP above that, but we see a convergence going on there as well. That say, say that we have 21, 20 plus standards uh, in network in the industrial area by now. I think within five years that will be reduced to five, five to ten, something like that. There are a couple of uh, exotic or really special applications like deterministic and real time and very fast guarantee response, which we we can address with deterministic Ethernet today as well. But these are with the real process control processes a little bit off limits for the standard vanilla TCP IP Ethernet. So, any questions about this? I mean, uh, are there standardization bodies you think we should participate in? Standards we should adhere to? See, this, this is an attempt to get interaction. <laughs> <laughs> we, we get there, we get there, yeah. So, a little bit about uh, partners. Um, this is an overview of the current partner set. It, it is in development, but uh, for uh, the energy market, which is called connected industry and utilities, where we're looking at, you see, I would say, the usual suspects like Emerson and Schneider, who were here today with us as well. Uh, but we have, for instance, healthcare, Covenson, who is uh, very good at consultancy in the healthcare and stuff like that. And why? Because Cisco, we make a lot of products, we have a lot of solutions, we have a lot of architectures where we think they support some business imperatives, but we don't have intellectual property about how to really control a process in a refinery. I mean, that's, that's not our core business. We are in the business of connectivity, do it securely, manageable, reliable, but don't let us manage a process in the, the distillery, refinery, or other stuff, because that's not our nature, intellectual property. So we, we, we uh, partner with partners who do know a lot about that. And most of the times, if not always, there's a, there's a good complement, like we take care of the connectivity part, and you partner do what you are good in your intellectual property. But the standard example, I use, which is not listed here, is SAP. SAP, when we started working together with SAP, SAP did a lot of network modules on the below SAP themselves as well. And they realized quickly, of course, look, we're not in the business of network transport. Cisco, you do that for us. So we can focus on our core business, the ERP, what makes us great, SAP. So we see that here more and more as well. So, a uh, relationship with being explored, you see a lot of uh, HET is, for instance, an interesting company, also for oil and gas, because um, they have solutions to control and monitor 24-7 dikes. Now, I'm from the Netherlands, okay? country 99% under the sea level, so we take that uh, close to our heart, but also in the oil business, you have these attrition ponds, which need to be monitored as well. Good. They are also uh, in connected uh, cities and so, but they have a couple of solutions which are very applicable for oil and gas as well. Any obvious parties we're missing here? Are you working with these people? Are these the usual suspects in your country as well? Yeah? Ah, interaction. Yeah. Good. <laughs> in Massad, it's not part of Sorry? In Massad. Uh, yeah, that, well, that's uh, for the satellite com uh, communication. They are, we have partnership with that, but it's not listed here. And for the oil and gas, it's an important one, especially the offshore, of course. But we're also looking at other uh, satellite companies and providers, but not that many. But for instance, we also look at O3B, which has not a geostationary, but a half uh, height uh, of the 
their satellites, which means they are not geostationary, so you have to track them. But the, the big advantage is that you have lower latency and more bandwidth. So, um, but indeed, Imersat is uh, another partner. We are there specifically for uh, what do you do if you're in the middle of nowhere and you have no connectivity to use satellites. Now, if you um, look where we play, we, we talk about uh, integrated operations, then it will not be a surprise to you that we are very strong on the bottom layers where you talk about routers, switches, firewalls, IDS, IPS, you name it, to have the basic connectivity, manageability and security on that. And the more you come, the more you go to the business processes itself. We, of course, are not relevant at the highest level. It's what have to do with values and norms of a company fed by local laws and regulations and uh, the objectives of the company. But we can, for instance, uh, provide solutions here like uh, WebEx and telepresence to have virtual meetings to facilitate that. Basically, what a I just said, is in this slide. Basic connectivity, security, manageability about it. Um, <coughs> relatively new is, uh, and Sergey also mentioned it, is fog computing or analytic at the edge. Uh, and if you're long enough in the business, you see this cyclic movement going on from central mainframes, client server models, distributed computing, and now back to a central or distributed computing model, because um, why the data is too large to move it up and down the, the wide area networks, to compute and send the result back. Now, since the data is too large, we bring the compute to the data. So that's batch analytics. And those pieces of hardware, uh, taking Moore's law in uh, mind, they are so powerful that a router or a switch with the hardware is only 5%, 10% utilized, maybe 20% if there's something weird going on. But the other 80% is not used. So what you can do is use on the second core of the CPU, the second CPU, you can run applications in a virtual machine. And you can run stuff there like OSI, Soft, Spy, Land Information, Historian kind of stuff. And of course, size varies, and you cannot run uh, seismological 3D high graphics on an 819, but you can do it on a flex spot with a lot of memory and stuff like that. But that's a paradigm shift. We bring the compute back to the data and have distributed compute. We um, have stuff like virtual experts, um, which really helps uh, stuff like not preventing unplanned downtime because that's pre pre uh, predictive maintenance, that's not a set of solutions we have. But if you have an unplanned downtime, the resolvement of that problem goes quicker because the expert doesn't have to go by plane, by helicopter to the location to look around. No, you bring the problem to the expert by high end video, audio, and a center of experts. Yeah? We do spend some uh, money on uh, research and development. Um, and that's mainly, of course, uh, well, software, SDN, is, is pretty large now that we still have more and more virtual routers, software-based routers, application-centric infrastructure, so we know the application in our network. Because one of our statements we always make, and we truly believe in that, of course, is the network is the only place who sees all the network traffic and data. It can be wireless, could be wired, but everything goes over the network. So that's a good place at certain locations to look on what's going on, do IDS, do IPS, do application-centric, higher priority and stuff like that, quality to observe, and so on. Yeah, so far with me, yeah. What's the value proposition for... Sorry? Yeah, SAP HANA is a, a solution which runs on our servers. We 
because you need really big memory yet, <laughs> and big uh, CPU. So that's an example of SAP HANA. We uh, acquired a company as well to do uh, real-time analytics. And we are building our portfolio on that, because once again, the data goes over the network, so you can do local analytics to get the, you know, the big data, you have big data, you want to have information, knowledge, wisdom out of it. Then instead of moving it all to the data center and do the data, information, knowledge, wisdom over there, you do it on the edge with a local analytics solution. So it's an up and coming field. Sorry? The central so you mean local processing? Yeah. We remember from this morning as well that 99.9% .9 of the data is discarded. In, in oil and gas, especially with seismological data, that's not always the case. But they want to have quick, faster, and better decisions. So they start doing analytics there where the data comes, at the edge. But still, they want to retain that raw data for a year from now, two years from now, when they have better models to go for that last piece of oil or gas in there. So we still have the problem, and nobody's addressing that, but we still have the problems how to get exabytes or petabytes of data to the central data center. And with current technology of wide area network bandwidths or even local area bandwidths, it's a tough problem to crack. I'm almost suggesting go back to the sneaker network, buy a jukebox with cheap disks, Fill the jukebox, move the jukebox to the data center. Okay. <laughs> Any other remarks, question? Keep them coming. I like it. Good. we work with like Bits2 is another company who's good on analytics and stuff like that. And once again, that's best base, back to our basic philosophy. We stay to our core business, connectivity, and we facilitate other companies to do their smart things on top of it. For instance, analytics. So, uh, two uh, examples about what kind of solutions you can see them. We talk about an oil rig here. We have stuff uh, to get faster and better decisions, expert decisions. We use video and audio two-way integration of handheld radios so that uh, somebody out there with a handheld radio can place a call on a normal telephone so that you have integration of connectivity and communication and stuff like that, and that you don't have to have a handheld radio and a phone to do the communication. Um, Industrial wireless, we come back to that with an example. All kinds of sensors, wired, wireless, mobile, tagging. Uh, a lot of the solutions where uh, we are good at by providing connectivity, also wireless and mobility kind of connectivity. Then you can do all kinds of track and trace kind of things. You saw it in the, in the video in the lunch break as well with the mining company. They have a tag on their helmet so they can track and trace where their tag is going. And we assume that people keep their head on so we know where to keep on. For the refinery, we have uh, some other solutions and similar solutions as well. I won't go into it uh, too much detail because, once again, I will give you the slides and a lot of background information there as well. And uh, Emerson, uh, the next speaker will also talk about uh, wireless sensor integration, convergence of uh, network there. Maybe and the one a bit about how, how can we, because on, on the conventional uh, refinery that has been around, yeah. there's always a challenge to bring wireless to the refinery yeah. because of doing the infrastructure and stuff is cheap. And then you know that sensors are going to work well with wireless. Yeah. So is that a Technology that can help us. To yeah, uh, about five five years ago, I worked. Uh, I was not in this role, but I was the embedded architect at Shell, Shell, 
and we did a, a project there called Iowa, Industrial Wireless Access Domain. And there are a couple of business reasons to go wireless. Uh, for instance, it is very expensive to run wire lines. And you don't know always what's in the ground, and you cannot shut down a fabric. So wireless, once it is in place, is a good, quick way of connecting. Now wireless doesn't mean without wires, because you need to have uh, connect the access points with wires. But usually you have some spare capacity, some, some spare fibers where you can put uh, access points so you have wireless coverage. So one of the reasons is early and fast deployment of wireless sensors. And one of the, the drivers at Shell was, look, we want to take a wireless sensor and put it in the field and let it work within a few days or a few hours. Now we have problems that we still have multiple uh, protocols like Zigbee, ESA 100, Wireless Heart, Wi-Fi, stuff like that. And there is a convergence going on, it's called uh, the EFRO project, where a lot of vendors are coming together to see if they can converge to one standard. Well, that will take a long time because everybody likes standards, especially if it's my standard. So, <laughs> it might take a, a little while, but what we see and in Emerson's uh, uh, presentation, we'll give an example as well, we're now capable of using wireless hard and ESA 100 and Wi-Fi over one network infrastructure. So we can carry the signals over one network. And that saves a lot of boxes and speeds up the deployment as well. Ideally, it would be nice if we have one standard RF protocol which will serve all, but that might take a while. So rapid deployment is one. Another benefit we found out or from is that with wired, you don't have mobility. <laughs> an extension cord running around. But if you're wireless, you can facilitate track and trace, what we already saw. You can facilitate handheld laptops or ruggedized laptops to do uh, yeah, whatever it is you want to do instead of writing it down on a piece of paper, go to the office and type it into the spreadsheet, you can read it uh, right away. So track and trace is healthy. And we identified something like 75 business applications who would benefit from being wireless and mobile. Now, mobility of wireless is not a silver bullet because it doesn't solve uh, other problems. One of the problems is that, for instance, uh, if there are radar signals in the area, military airplanes or other radar, by law, everybody, other, other vendors as well, have to shut down their Wi-Fi, or at least that channel, maybe. up to another channel and stuff like that. So that's just by the law and regulation that wireless is sometimes difficult to deploy in very time critical deterministic processes. I would not recommend doing that today. Use wire for that stuff. Like that. <coughs> but the business case of wireless, and I will show you some more examples going on, are a pretty uh, large number of business examples. Yeah. So, we talk about use cases, user reference, customer references, but more important is the CVPOs, Customer Validated Business Outcomes. The slides I didn't show you were all about increase of revenue, decrease of cost, avoidance of cost, or retention, loyalty kind of stuff. So a couple of these outcomes, we let the customer validate it with a quote and basically this, okay, show the money. How much was in there for you for that solution? And we have, a, I've selected uh, two or three. Um, one is uh, Dutch Shell, and Shell is in the room here as well. Uh, it's about uh, secure ops. You know that in an industrial area, like a refinery, but also an offshore oil rig or an exploration field, there is an infrastructure which need to maintain in the sense of version control, antivirus, patch distribution, you name it. All kinds of household things to make sure that it is up to standards, that location. And we talk about secure ops, 
that the process control domain is the area we call a remote manage of secure operations. But it could be anything which is remote. Also, for instance, in banking, it could be a remote uh, branch which you manage because there's the same problem. I have to make sure that all the levels of the operating system are up to a certain level, that all these and these, these patches are applied, these antiviruses are done, these audit files or log files are monitored for auditing and being compliant and so on. So uh, at Shell and other customers, historically and hysterically, it grew and grew and there were proprietary solution of all the vendors of the solutions, like Honeywell, Emerson, Yogacara, Defensis, ABB, you name it. They put down their solution and their own stovepipe solution for management and access to them. So that became a very hybrid, hard to manage, very expensive to operate solution. And Shell and Cisco worked on that to get a secure plan which is now made generic and called Secure Ops. So, a little bit more detail on this. You have seen this slide in the, the previous presentation of uh, Schneider Electric as well. There's quite a few things you have to do to be in control of your remote process control domain, like asset inventory management. The slides will come be, be uh, available Nice. <laughs> um, if, for instance, Cisco is a large company. We have a lot of offices, a lot of data centers, a lot of R&D stuff. We have to secure them as well, and we do a very good job at that. But one of the first steps, of course, is that you have to know what's out there in your network before you can start managing and protecting it. So one of the first, sometimes colossal step, is to make it Asset inventory, what is out there? And of course, uh, everything is TCP, IP, Ethernet, right? So if you do a ping sweep, we find everything, right? Uh, not really. There's many PLCs and DSS systems which do not react to ping sweeps but because they don't have ICMP enabled or not even TCP, IP, Ethernet based. So, we have to find, and we work together with partners there as well, to make a complete inventory. Then, then you start organizing, planning, that's the before phase, you start implementing it, and then run and operate kind of thing. I can talk for days about this. Unfortunately, I'm not allowed to, so. We'll, uh, but if you have questions about it, please reach out to me or to Sergi, and we can talk more about it. You see that, the complexity is that each and every step is not, well, some are not simple, but they are not too difficult in general, but there are so many thousands of steps you have to take that it's overwhelming. Now, by automating that and simplifying that, you go from a situation where we have this, that every plant and manual process is there, where you see if you're compliant, which patch is uh, installed, what virus, and so on. A manual process, a lot of spreadsheets, cumbersome, boring, error prone, stuff like that. And we move to a situation on the right hand side, or um, I hope the animation is coming after there, where you automatically collect all that information you need to audit. And then you can say, hey, location XYZ, you didn't apply these patches yet, which we provided to you several weeks ago. Please start deploying those patches, otherwise we're not compliant anymore and we get an audit fine and stuff like that. Make sense? Pretty straightforward. Not that straightforward to implement or run. But uh, we're we getting good results. more interesting you're going to see the trend over time and you can see this refinery the compliance is going down and this facility they're trying to catch up with patches and they're pretty much exactly how they can make a decision either out of the south there's probably put more resources there or what's happened what's the reason and we know that some of the customers actually giving that visibility to 
one level manager of one refinery or one region, so they can see what he's he or they're doing and create a bit of a competition between them. They say, one is doing well, others are not doing well. Yeah. This is the first time ever we're giving a real time visibility. You can know your compliance today. It wasn't compliance on the last audit or the last checks, it was compliance on today. Yeah, so, so by automating it and making it visible and that you can share it. You get a lot of strong leverage over your whole company. Um, yeah, it won't say that disasters won't happen because that's another thing. But you're in control, and not unexpected downtime will occur that much anymore. Now, this is another solution uh, from a customer validated business outcome. We talked a little bit about it as well. Here even the, the game was far more. We went back from 30 different physical networks to three different physical networks. So we got rid of 31 networks. Yeah, that's, that's the arithmetic behind it. But if you think what that means, uh, for instance, only from the weight of the cables, I've been told that, that 32 networks, 31 networks, would be over 1,000 metric tons in weight. That's a big saving in weight as well. Not only in capex, but in weight, in space, in racks, and stuff like that. So it keeps adding on the benefits of that. Is that secure? Yes, it is secure. We made utmost care that it was in appliance with ISA 99 and IEC 6243 standard and other standards. And why free networks? Um, you might all know the Purdue model or not, but you have the enterprise domain, that's one network. There's a lot of virtualization on that VLANs and what we are used in enterprise. The second network is the process control domain network, where we have moderate virtualization, virtualization of servers for the HMI, the, the OSI soft servers and stuff like that. They are virtualized. They are running on virtualized servers, stuff like that. So, uh, we have strong network segregation in that as well. And we, the third network is the SIS network with no virtualization. The big red button always has to work. They don't trust anything but the separate network. Okay, that's the third network. Make sense? So going forward, uh, because uh, Stato and Aegis Solution is the partner for uh, Stato and London, uh, they're going to build like 35 offshore oil rigs the next 10, 15 years for the Johan Sverdrup oil and gas field, which is the largest oil and gas field in the North Sea for the last 30 years or so. Are they still going to do it with the current oil price? Well, let's say it this way. We have some more time to finalize the details of the architectures and the design. But they will want to do it. Actually, they are all working on free oil rigs. So we have great products, great solution, great architecture, great partnerships. And it works. Uh, because sometimes it was difficult, we do great projects, but we forget to document them, and then customers talk to us, and where did you do it before? And then we say, yeah, well, you bring in the other customers, stuff like that, but now we can document and talk about it as well, since the customer validated business outcomes uh, are very important. I look at the timekeeper, how much time do I still have? F 30 minutes? 30? <laughs> <laughs> um, Marathon Oil is the standard example for customer validated business outcome, and this is all to do with the, the wireless coverage. They had a business imperative that uh, at their uh, Robinson plant, uh, a couple of people died because they came into poisonous areas with sulfide gas and other stuff. We made a solution together with uh, partners, uh, Aeroscout partner. They make the RFID tags to do the actual track and trace where the people are. Scientific industries, they make portable gas detectors. So it can see uh, the levels of uh, sulfide gas or how much the concentration was before it got combustion and stuff like that. Wireless track and trace was done by uh, Cisco. And the whole integration was done by uh, Accenture. Yeah. So you see, there we work with a couple of partners because we don't make RFID tags. Aeroscout does. We don't make gas meters. Scientific industry does. And uh, back then, Accenture did the whole system integration. So 
So that's the modern equivalent of the canary in the cage. Now done electronically. Now, if you look at some of the customer uh, use cases, and once again, there are like 10 in here, but I'm going to show four, and I have to end with industrial wireless, of course, that's a nice handover to the next presentation from Amazon. Um, we have stuff like, uh, for instance, truck monitoring, uh, that's in mining, those expensive trucks, everything is monitored. The, the pressure of the tires, the temperature of the oil, even nowadays they look at the driver for signs of fatigue, right? so they'll listen if he snores, kind of thing, to prevent uh, and do pre reactive uh, management and monitoring of those expensive assets. Not going to go into connected pipeline operation because that was the example from this morning from Schneider Electric, where you can do with SCADA and security and stuff like that. So I'm going to click on number nine. To go to uh, secure ops, well, that's a little bit uh, double up because we already had a customer value. But you see, once again, what it was about, what the solution was, what the outcomes, and what the technology enablers was. Um, you should also not forget that all the, the products and the tools and the solutions and the architectures we have and can position, if you don't use them correctly, you still make a mess of it. Yeah. Give a fool a tool, and it's still a fool, is the English saying. So, education, training, monitoring, retraining, recertification, all those human and processes aspects, we can help customers with that, but it's up to the customer itself to implement it correctly. Yeah. Okay. So, that's one of the tools, and if we go back then, we decided to go for number three, which is an example of remote site management. Uh, you have many different remote locations. Think of mobile drilling rigs, offshore oil rigs, those kind of things, those move around, and they need connectivity. And what you can do with remote site management, it's kind of depicted here, make sure that at the remote site we do a small footprint installation where one of them is dedicated for the office environment and one is dedicated for the process domain. So we have the separation, which is what security auditors like to see. Where's the red cable, where's the blue cable? Well, we have a blue flight case and white flight case. And you keep that traffic separated and at the central uh, operating center, one part gets denoted, you can see it, but to the level three, so that's the process control thing, and one to level four, which is the enterprise. In that way, you have central management again, and you can use that as well to run secure ops on top of that, of course, to make sure that all the ethnic, uh, patches are pushed out and stuff like that. But you have connectivity, office connectivity, including video, phones, what have you at the remote side in a reasonable short time. Okay? Five minutes. What you see visually are boxes and we also have a small box as well. So this is what we call rigging box. Uh, the other next generation what we look for we call it rigging shoe box. So <laughs> all of this is actually becoming much smaller to get yeah. like innovative virtualizations to make it very small but the, the drives are rapid deployment and being agile. So you can move around, short time to build up, short time to tear down and move again. So, um, now live down uh, safety uh, HSE is the Marathonol. Here you see a little bit more detail, the RFID tags we use to track and trace the portable gas meter for different kind of uh, poisonous gases and concentrations. And the wireless of uh, the access points which we core for the wireless canopy coverage area. So they can just run around. Uh, it's not only for uh, man down in, in the true sense of man down that the person doesn't move anymore because you can detect that too. But if the person doesn't move anymore, you're in trouble already. 
it doesn't move anymore. But also, if there is fire or something, you have to evacuate the whole location. You can use that to send all the people to the muster place, but you can also see who's not going there, walking the different direction. So you can quite easily have an overview which people are in which area, and make sure that they leave that area if they have. Any questions about this? Does this seem like a solution you want to have as well at your locations? Do you already have it? Don't you need it? Don't you want it? What any ideas? Sir, do you have any ideas about this? Well, we are in the process of uh, setting up the uh, wireless network to enable this. For the coverage and the connectivity, so you can move around. Also, for men down, or also asset tracking, or. Uh, Couple of, couple of things. Men down, asset, uh, asset and uh, personal tracking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, smart to use for multiple things, eh? if you have the connectivity and the mobility. It takes time to build up the system. I mean, uh, you know, the I'm wondering about it, and I'm looking to you uh, here on the front row. Uh, vessels. Would this work on vessels as well? I could see this for a safety measurement for man overboard kind of thing. Is, or is that too much wishful thinking? Well, what do we think? Vessel, we will put this uh, technology right? uh, for the old one, probably it's time to yeah, from a technology point of view, I don't see why it shouldn't work. But my technology inside is not always the same as the rest of the world. <laughs> or business dictates differently, of course. So, um, industry wireless, well, we already talked about it quite a bit. Um, we had to learn a lot of things there. Like 10 years ago, we moved into the industrial, or 15 years ago, or stuff like that. Wireless, of course, is something of the last few years getting really popular. We have all the experience with wireless networks in universities, and offices, and governmental buildings, and stuff like that. But doing a wireless site survey in an, in an environment like this, with a lot of steel reflections, corridors, is something quite different. <coughs> Not only do you have to be more precise and higher resolution with your site survey, but I remember that I was going to Moordijk, a location of Shell, to do a wireless site survey. And it took me seven tries to get into the uh, area. Because I had to be on the security list, being announced that I come. I had to be accompanied by somebody from security to run around in that area. The equipment we use to do the actual site survey measuring had to be ATEX or IEC-EX certified. We didn't know that. So we learned, and now we know. But that's, that's what makes uh, my job so fun. Uh, I learn new things every day from, well, I had one minute, eh, so another story is uh, still good at that. Uh, very pragmatic things. Enterprise networks and equipment and products are totally different than industrial network products. They have to be more sturdy, they have to be ruggedized, and they have to be certified for ATEX proof or ICEX proof. And we have those switches which you put on a DIN rail, taken into production, and we certify them. And what did we do? We put the, the sticker, the label, that it's certified on the back of the switch and click the production. Solved. Security audit. The auditor said, where is the sticker, the label, that is ATEX certified? Yeah, it's on the back of the switch. I don't see it. No, it is on the back of the switch. Well, can you remove the switch and show me? No, it's a production system. I cannot touch it. Well, you failed the audit. Plastic labels for, audit, for labels, uh, for models, in an environment like this, they last, what, three months, six months, and then they are unbreathable. So we had to go to the metal embroised labels on the outside in the front where you can read them. 
tiny things. But it's a showstopper for your project. Oh, okay. Um, that's it for me, I think, because now. I'm, uh, White space technology. Sorry, white space technology? Yeah. Uh, I don't know what it would be called. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, the, the frequency band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a lot of fun with that as well. Um, the traditional for Wi Fi, the 802 uh, 11 series of the protocols, we use 2.4 megahertz and 5 megahertz. In America, we also use 900 megahertz, 600 megahertz is being used. Um, the whole white space uh, discussion is happening as well because we get it gets pretty busy in that 2.4 band and the 5 band. So, as far as I know, we do research about it, but for the foreseeable future, we'll stay in 2.4 and 5 megahertz. The, the new standard with Wi Fi at 802.11ac, which goes up to 900 gigahertz has to use the 5 megahertz band because it can work in the 2.4 megahertz band. So we're constantly shifting around and there are different locations in the world which use different frequency bands, different uh, regulations as well, but I said uh, about uh, radar signals and how to deal with radar signals. So uh, Wi-Fi is not Wi-Fi is not Wi-Fi if you look globally in the world. And it has a lot of challenges and white space or using different frequency bands is one of them. I don't know where it will go. But you guys are not IoT testing. Well, we, we part of the IET of the IEEE and uh, the ESA 100 committees, for instance, to see where it's going and to influence what we think is a good way to go, of course. And we have a couple of partners. Yeah, but the, 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 the And of course, you, you have different kinds of RF technology. Like I said, you have Bluetooth, you have Wi Fi, ESA 100, wireless heart, WiMAX, microwave, satellite links. I think uh, in the actual handy, we do see a lot of value you know, because the mm -hmm. device space coverage is 8 to 9 kilometers. Mm -hmm. Right? So, yeah. Uh, I don't know where you are. If it is uh, going into that white space then no doubt that we're going to support products with using that frequency then. But to be honest, I don't know where it's going. Yeah, it's not the problem, it's just been testing that in time. The last question. So, the noise uh, example that you gave, uh, are those systems managed by existing domains like enterprise IT or operational IT or you have a mix? Because, you know, in our world, it is all converged, integrated, end to end, of course. So, I mean, we have that problem. Who's going to manage it? Is it OT? Is it IT? And it depends. I have smaller customers who don't have the money to run both an IT and an OT department, so the problem solved. So that group of work will do both. <laughs> Uh, the larger companies, you do see convergence, but uh, we have said it before, OT doesn't trust IT, and IT doesn't trust OT, and they don't understand each other. And one of the most difficult parts of my job was to learn to talk the talk for OT, talk the talk, I learned to talk for IT, 
but word translation. Uh, very simple thing. In enterprise, we talk CIA. Confidentiality is very important. Integrity is important. Availability as well. But let's face it. Availability is usually the printer in the hall doesn't work. So in the OT, it's availability X equal with integrity because it needs to be all the time up. It needs to be available. And if I send close that valve, it should arrive there as close to valve. Otherwise, you get stuck in stuff. So, but confidentiality is a lot of things that we can So what is important? How does it work? And like I said, in OT, it's not, I mean, we have 20 plus different protocols. It's not only TCP, IP, Ethernet, where Cisco sometimes thinks that's the world. So where do you manage it? Where the capability is managed. Now, sometimes you can do it as a service. For instance, that secure ops, uh, you can do it yourself, you can do it on premises, off premises. And I do see more and more in the cloud kind of services for process control domain SCADA applications as well. Well, is that trustworthy? Yeah, I think it's trustworthy for doing one something at the temperature reading, but not for 10 milliseconds real time loops like that. And that's not one size fits all solution and stuff like that. So, in, in conclusion, uh, the presentation will become uh, available. Farrell, thank you for willing to ask questions if nobody else has questions. And luckily, you have good interaction. I like it. Thank you very much. We are all only one email away, Georgie, me, and the other people. So, if you have questions, you get slides. If you have questions about that, please reach out to us. We sent you more slides. <laughs> <laughs>